Let's play a game against Matt Holmes. Okay. So I am going to play an opening, which I have played my whole life. The King's Indian Defense. As with every new opening that I play, I will explain the basics behind this opening after the game. I simply do not have the time to do it now. But basically, as I've already explained before, the King's Indian is what's called a hyper-modern opening, where you allow your opponent to control the center, and then you attack that center from a distance with some of your pieces. Now, h4 is a very strange move, but it's an understandable move. He's trying to rush his pawn to h5 as early as possible. I'm going to stop him in his tracks by playing h5. This is not a necessary move, but I don't want to deal with this kind of stuff. Thank you, DS Sherman. Now, if you look at this pawn on d4 very carefully, how can we apply more pressure on this pawn? We can do it in one of two ways. We can do it directly by attacking, or we can do it by removing one of the defenders of this pawn, i.e. the bishop on e3. Both ways are possible. Let's start by developing our pieces, right? Let's start by going knight to c6 and developing our pieces. Surgical taste. Thank you for the prime. And if he pushes his pawn to d5, that then creates weaknesses in the center, which we can occupy with our pieces. That's not something we should be afraid of, because our knight can whirl its way around to e5, the nice central square. In the King's Indian, you, want, you have to be comfortable with provoking a lot of pawn moves, which may look intimidating, but actually be bad. Thank you, Skittle. And this is a perfect example of one such move. He, he seems to occupy a lot more of the center, but now we turn to the second method of attacking the pawn on d4 by removing the defender of this pawn. Look at this bishop on e3. Look at it carefully. Can we try to remove this bishop from e3? We absolutely can. That's why he shouldn't have played h4, because now this is a weak square. We put our knight there. He's in huge trouble already. He's got to move his bishop, or he's got to defend it, but the, the end result of it is going to be the same. He's going to lose the d4 pawn, and with that pawn, his entire position is going to collapse very quickly. That's part of the appeal of an opening such as the King's Indian. He prefers the second option. Now, what should we take on d4 with? The bishop or the knight? And don't rush to give me the obvious answer here. This is where you really want to apply yourself. We should take not with the knight, that's the tempting move, we should take with the bishop. Because this is actually a skewer. If his rook moves, we simply take his undefended knight. Now a case could be made that the bishop is so strong that we shouldn't even give it up for the rook. But I would say that we should. I mean, an exchange is an exchange. He decides to give away the knight. Not a good call, because this bishop is going to be easily evacuated back to d4 and then back to its home on g7. This is what they call the king's Indian bishop. Uh, and it is a malicious bishop indeed. But before we uh, evacuate anything, what can we do here to win even more material? Absolutely. That square is going to be in his nightmares. The g4 square is going to be in my opponent's nightmares. He resigns. And that was a nice game. A good introduction to the King's Indian. Okay. Um, nice, nice, nice. One moment, please. Okay. Um, so basically, basically... The King's Indian, and a little bit of chess history here. And I've already done this before, but I actually don't remember. When was the King's Indian first played? The King's Indian, at least in the modern formulation, was first played. And I'm going to give you guys a multiple choice uh, question here. And I've already, I've already shared this piece of information before. So I'm going to give you guys three choices. Was the King's Indian first played 50 years ago? Approximately. 100 years ago? 150 years ago? Or 200 years ago? And uh, this is the one time you guys are allowed to spam. So enjoy it. Okay, a lot of you guys are getting it, actually. I mean, a lot of you guys are getting it very close. Uh, the answer is a hundred and so it was first played in the year 1851, which is about 170 years ago. And it was played extensively by a guy named Bonnergee. And Bonnergee was a uh, Indian player from the 1850s who was the first to play the King's Indian in a match against John Cochran, a character that we've already encountered before, who himself developed many openings. After 1855, it was played in 1879 by Lewis Powelson, uh, very, one of the leading players of the day. Uh, and I've made this sort of sermon before, but uh, you have to understand that back when these people were around, it was very much not commonplace to give up the center like this. 
Okay, so nowadays we think, well, what's so impressive about this random dude playing the King's Indian? It's the fact that he was laughed at when he played this opening because back then it was anathema to simply relinquish uh, completely the control of the center. So it was quite impressive that these players nonetheless decided to experiment with it. They didn't play it perfectly, but they set the, the groundwork for, uh, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Now we know how to play these openings, but they were the first ones who took the plunge. Okay, um, so he played h4, which again is a big mis... Well, it's not a big mistake, but it sets him, sets him up for failure because it weakens the g4 square. The main move here is knight f3, simply developing the pieces, because it's very important to support the center. You could play f4 here. That's the four pawns attack. It's a very dangerous opening for black, but it's also very hard to play for white, because oftentimes he bites off more than he can chew. There is a queen's Indian as well. The queen's Indian, for those interested, and I've played the queen's Indian many times is this opening, right? Where you fee and keto the other bishop, the queen's bishop. This is the king's Indian. This is now, some of you asked, what wasn't this a perk? A perk is like the cousin of the king's Indian. And the difference between the king's Indian and the perk is that the perk happens after one e4. In the king's Indian, white usually has a pawn on c4. The openings can transpose into each other, but that's the main difference. So uh, generally in the king's Indian, Actually, you don't play knight c6, you play either e5 contesting the pawn directly, or you play Benoni style with c5. Uh, so the move knight c6 we allowed ourselves to make, uh, by and large, because he already weakened his position. So if he goes d5, again, he creates all these holes on, in his position, which we can occupy with our pieces. Um, the perk is a good opening. Yeah, I've played the perk, but I don't recommend it to beginners. And now f4 was basically the decisive mistake. We slam a knight into g4, we attack his bishop. If he moves the bishop, then we take this juicy central pawn. He decided to defend this bishop, and now we play bishop takes d4, skewering his rook to his knight. He should have at least given up the exchange rather than the knight, but he's still in very big trouble. He's down he's down a, a an exchange and a pawn. Uh, what if he went pawn to e5? Uh, it, at, at which position? At one of your previous games, you played h4. Well, basically, the difference is that he's not developed. When you're not developed at all, it rarely is a good idea to send your corner pawn in motion because that simply creates more weak squares. And it's one of those things that, you know, I always compare to like driving a bus, right? You can play h4. You'll even see that some GMs have played it. But just because GMs have played a move doesn't mean you should play it because they've put a lot of thought into it. They've prepared it. And it needs to be played in a very specialized fashion, right? You can't just, even I can't play the move h4 without preparation because it's a very risky move. Okay. Um, thank you, nine volts. This seems too many. Yeah. Um, if the pawns are protected perfectly, it would be, what is the big difference between King's Indian and modern? Yeah. The modern is E4 G6. Again, the modern usually transposes into the perk, but it can also transpose into the King's Indian. If white plays C4 narcoleptic Wook, Thank you for the prime, my friend. Um, any questions? Why don't I recommend the perk to beginners? Okay, I'll, I'll keep this brief because I know people are looking forward to me playing. I'll do one more game. Latinum Blonde with a five tier one subs to the community. Incredible stuff here going on. Thank you so much. Latinum Blonde for another hype. Five gifted subs. Incredible level of support here as we approach 4,500 subs. I can't believe it. Okay, sorry. I'm pretty excited. Okay. So my theory of chess improvement, and please take this with a grain of salt because I have a lot to learn in the realm of teaching. Uh, you know, there's every student teaches me something, I, I get better, I make mistakes. So this isn't like a, a theory that's been graven in stone, right? Uh, it's just one man's perspective. I'm not saying that I'm right. This is just my personal perspective born of my experience. And my perspective is that people need to learn and get a very, very steady handle on chess principles, basic chess principles, as boring as it may be, right? It's like you watch you watch Michael Phelps, you know, swim laps, right, in the Olympics, and you want to jump into the pool. And then some jerk named Daniel Nerdisky comes along and says, well, you need those, like, sleeves, you know, that, that little kids have when they're learning how to swim. Like, I want to swim with Michael Phelps. But you can understand, I'm sure, that in order to swim like Michael Phelps one day, uh, you need to master the technique, right? And playing classical openings, you can liken to mastering the technique. You have the sleeves on, 
I still have the sleeves on. I play e4, e5. There's nothing wrong with this opening. But when you play the perk, you jump right into like whitewater rafting, you know, when you barely know how to swim. And, you know, playing openings where you give your opponent a big share of the center, as you guys have seen from my games in the perk, is very difficult. It requ requires specialized knowledge of how to play these positions. And so I don't really recommend these openings to people normally before they reach, you know, 16, 1700, give or take, although every player is different. Hopefully that makes sense. Hey, doctor, should we do one more? No, King, the King's Indian has not been refuted. So Rad Brogoff, you, you have something a little bit off because the King's Indian is currently considered one of the most reputable openings in existence. It hasn't been refuted. In fact, it's had a resurgence in the last couple of years. Kremez, thank you for the prime. So I'm not aware of Alpha Zero refuting the King's Indian. 6,000 viewers, let's go and let's continue. And I'm not saying that because I'm emotional. I, I am emotionally attached to the King's Indian. Let's play e5. Let's put the training sleeves back on. And he plays the Ponciani. Now, the Ponciani is a dangerous opening. Uh, and it is something, even I haven't reviewed it very much. And uh, the response that I'm going to play is a counter gambit. Actually, let me think about what I want to do here. Um, there are several ways to deal with the Ponciani. And the Ponciani, the idea is, is white wants to, of course, go d4. I am going to play a very aggressive response to this move, f5. I'm going to counter strike in the center before he gets a chance to play d4. Now, he can still play d4. In fact, I think that's his main move. Uh, but f5 is a very dangerous move. Obviously, it's a very dangerous move. I'm weakening my king. I'm exposing my king. But I'm banking on the fact that he has not developed a piece. He's moved a pawn. Not only has he moved a pawn, he's blocked his own knight from coming out to c3, which I think lessens the immediate risk of opening up my king. Now, his queen wants to come to h5 and do me quite a bit of damage, so it's very important now to develop quickly. Knight f6, this is theory. I don't know this, actually. I'm experimenting with this myself. Now, he goes bishop c4, so he's threatening, of course. Fork, how should we deal with this? Are we already lost? <laughs> We're not lost, but how should we deal with this? We should go d5 and block that bishop in. Now, bishop b5, I think, is theory. Goes bishop b3, which is a little bit passive. Now, this knight on e5, obviously, uh, I see the same thing that you guys see, which is this knight is very annoying. Now, we shouldn't take this knight, because if we take this knight, he takes back. And then if you, if you follow this, you'll see that he puts a lot of pressure on this d5 pawn. So let's try to force the trade on our own terms. And we can do that by developing our bishop to d6. It's very good when you can do many things at once. We develop a piece. And we basically give that knight a little nudge, right? Can you take c6, please? Now, what's going to happen if he takes our knight? If he takes our knight, then we take with a pawn. And as I've explained many times, we shouldn't think of this as a bad pawn structure. This is actually a good pawn structure. We have a pawn chain. Just because the pawns are doubled, that's okay, right? That, that's not the end of the world. I know what a lot of you guys are thinking. Greek gift sacrifice. But it actually doesn't work. Super important. And after the game, I'll show why it doesn't actually work. Instead of the Greek gift, we should simply develop our pieces with castles. There's a very important reason that the Greek gift sacrifice doesn't work here. Now, just because the Greek gift doesn't work doesn't mean that we shouldn't attack his king. We absolutely should attack his king. But in order to attack his king, we have to solve a couple of problems. One of which is the fact that he's spanning our knight. We really want to get our knight to g4. The immediate thing that comes to mind is h6. But what I don't want to allow is his bishop to come to g3 and trade itself off for our bishop, which is one of our strongest attackers. So instead of forcibly removing the bishop from the pin, what should we do to also try to employ or involve one of our main pieces? We should go queen e8. This is a very typical idea in many positions. We get our queen to g6. Uh, we will dislodge the bishop. And now our knight can move as well. And we are spoiled for choice. Finally, guess what, guys? The Greek gift sacrifice finally works here. And again, worry not, I will explain all of this after the game in detail so everybody will understand exactly why it works now. I wouldn't actually even do it in a game, but I'm going to demonstrate the Greek gift here. Uh, this is not as simple as it appears. White has several defensive resources. But where should the queen go? And, it, and this is the typical continuation of the Greek gift. I know, Aram, this is crazy. Yeah, let's get queen over to h2. We're not playing this to attack the bishop. We're playing this move to come out to h2. 
I don't think he has any way to stop it other than giving up his queen for our knight. That's obviously not a very feasible option. Oh. All right, he doesn't actually stop mate. Well, that was well earned. Okay, um, so first of all, load runner seven. Thank you for the tier one. Let's first talk some history. Now, this move C3 um, is called the Ponciani, uh, the Ponciani game. Uh, and as often happens in these situations, according to my research, Ponciani never actually played it. Ponciani, I believe, was a 19, was an 18th century player who simply advocated for it. And according to my research here, the first, oh, this is really interesting. In the first ever game to feature the Ponciani, which is Withers against Williams, two British players... Guess what Williams actually played? Thank you, Ivani Pani. Guess what move Black played here? This is actually quite funny. Maybe I'm a reincarnation of this person. He played the move F5. Uh, so actually, I decided to play the very same move uh, that this guy Williams played, who was the first person to ever face the Ponciani in a tournament game. So F5 is a very logical move. That's how they used to play back in the 18th century. It was immediately a gambit. Nowadays... The main move is knight f6. Thank you, Kakao6. And knight f6 leads to some really interesting complications. White goes d4. Uh, obviously, white center is under a lot of fire. There's this idea. I won't go into the theory. If you play e5 with black, you should definitely study the Ponciani a little bit. But this move f5, I think, is one of the better, better defenses against the Ponciani even now. d4 by white. Now, who won that game? It was a draw. Now, what happens, can somebody tell me, if white takes on f5? Why am I not simply blundering upon and opening up my king? What is going to be the continuation here? And this is a very typical thing. Well, d5 is not the best. I think the best is to go e4, immediately attacking this knight. The knight is nowhere good to go. If it goes to d4, well, we can capture it and ruin white's pawn structure. And we, we stake a big claim in the center, kind of like the Schliemann and the Ray Lopez. So d4. Uh, takes, takes. Uh, knight f6 developing our knight. Now we blunt the bishop. And now I think he made a big mistake. Bishop b5 here is more active because it attacks c6. It probably forces us to develop our bishop to d7. And he can take the bishop. He has the two bishops game. He has the uh, two bishops. Now one interesting tidbit is that f5 was played, I think, yes. So it was played by Julio Becerra, Cuban Grandmaster, against Hikaru Nakamura in uh, 2007 in the U.S. Championship. So Hikaru was rated 26.58 back then. Becerra actually won a very nice game. Hikaru surprised him with the Ponciani. Becerra played f5. So this is a very dangerous move. And the Hikaru game actually continued. Oh, so Hikaru played bishop b5 immediately. He played bishop b5 here in order to prevent the, develop, the deployment of the d-pawn. Renoir, 1977. And I actually was going to mention this, but I wasn't 100% sure. Um, so anyways, bishop b3, bishop d6, dislodging the knight. Now, very important. Why does the Greek gift sacrifice not work? Now, there's a checklist of one, two, three, four items, okay, that you have to go through kind of like a pilot before landing, before you go for a Greek gift sacrifice. And item number four is what people always forget. Item number one is obvious. Is there a bishop that can sacrifice itself on h2? And when I say h2, you can mirror this to, to, to h7, all right? It's symmetrical. Yes, there is. Item number two. Is there a knight that can follow up with a check to the king on g4 or g5? And is that square defended? Sometimes, if I didn't have a bishop on c8, I wouldn't have been able to do that because the queen would have been able to take the knight, right? Because, well, uh, here, of course, I can take. Item number three. Do you have a queen that can then move out to h4 uh, or h5 and combine with the knight in the way that the Greek gift sacrifice happens? Yes, we do. Three out of three. Item number four. After all of this happens, does your opponent have the capacity to defend the diagonal or the h2 square directly? And this is what people forget to check about, to check. What can white do in this position? He can get his bishop out to f4. And guess what? This bishop is guarding h2. Despite the imposing appearance of these pieces, black actually doesn't have a follow-up. I don't have any pieces. He's going to get his bishop to g3. He's going to stabilize, and he's going to be up a piece. Now, I can show you guys a million examples, a million examples of people who have Greek gifted 
and then forgotten to check for item number four and lost the game in, in a relatively uneventful fashion. In fact, I'm going to find one such game for you guys. Here is a position which occurred in a game between a player who is not famous, but probably like 2000, and Erwin Lugnowski. I think he was an IM or an FM, 2375. And in this position, Mr. Burnett played bishop takes h7. He said, ladies and gentlemen, great gift sacrifice. We got this guy. And he goes knight g5. Now, item number two was circumvented because here black can take the, the knight. But what happens is that white plays hg. This is a very common thing in the Greek gift. I've actually even talked about this in a previous speedrun game. And in lieu of the knight, we have the rook, which basically achieves exactly the same effect of threatening checkmate on h8. So this would be winning. This might be the most viewers I've ever had. So uh, again, this is a big honor and, and thank you, everybody. Now, uh, Lipnowski calmly returned to g8 and, and Bernat was, I'm sure, quite excited here. What did he miss? It's Electro. Thank you for the prime. D M D nine five eight four subbing to Tiv Binny. Boom goes the dynamite. Bishop d three, and this is exactly item four. You forgot to check. Queen e four check would do the same thing technically, but it would blunder the queen. And this move is forgotten about all the time. White has simply no threats. The bishop is going to return to g six, and White resigned because he's simply down a uh, down a piece. Okay, so this isn't like. Real people don't miss this stuff, they do. And that's why I'm explaining it because it has real chess applications. That's a hard move to see when you're calculating ahead. How do I find these games so quickly? Well, I'm using a search tool on chess base. I can show that later. Now here, once again, some people said bishop takes h2 works because we can play knight g4 exposing the bishop and then we can take the bishop, 100 bits, thank you. What is it that we're missing here? What can white do? And, and this is something I've seen people fall for as well. The problem here is that our queen is hanging, which means that he now has the license to take on g4. And if we take back, he takes our queen. At the end of the day, we're going to be down a piece. Thank you, Evolves, for the sub. Uh, and that's not good. Now, in a situation like this, you might see, wait a second. Both queens are hanging, which means we're looking for a way to move our queen with check. We can do that, but unfortunately, he can block the check with his queen. And now he ends up two pieces up. That's not good either, okay? 6K viewers, we've broken it. Now, here, what is the difference? Why does the Greek gift sacrifice work here? Well, let's go down the four items. Do we have a bishop to sacrifice on h2 with? We do. Do we have a knight and is the g4 square protected? It is. Do we have a queen to get to h5? Yes, we do. Item four, can he defend the square with his bishop or his queen or his knight? No, he cannot. This square is protected by the pawn. And most importantly, this square is now protected by our rook. So just logically speaking, you can see the difference between this Greek gift and that Greek gift. Any questions about the Greek gift? Of course, he should have given up his queen. That was the best he could do. Okay, W Zutali. Where do you live now? Charlotte and C, and I'm back home as of today. Let's go with a Sicilian. And the type of Sicilian that I recommend to players in the 17, 1800 range is the Accelerated Dragon. Once again, I will explain stuff after the game in terms of the opening. But in the Accelerated Dragon, you go for the Kingside Fianchetto a lot faster than you do in the regular Dragon. That's why it's called the Accelerated. And you basically accelerate also your development. You develop all of your pieces quickly, uh, including your king. So let's castle. This is all theory. And he falls into the oldest trick in the book. One of the great things about the Accelerated Dragon is the traps that are contained within it. Uh, people often play the Accelerated as if it were the real dragon, not realizing that in this position, black has a very vicious trap. Does anybody know this trap? What should black do in this position? I'll be quite impressed. Black has a very cool move here. I will explain this in very great depth after the game. But anybody who plays the Accelerated, do you guys know Shark? Shark knows it. Halux, thank you for the gifted. Queen to b6 is the move. You guys might be looking at this and saying, what are you doing? You're putting your queen right under the line of fire of the bishop. What kind of trap is that? You're going to trap your own queen. But this is actually a very dangerous move. White is already in trouble if he doesn't know what to do. He goes queen to d2. Now he's hoping for us to take b2. That's actually not what we're going to do. What are we going to do? Does anybody know the follow-up? The follow-up, Yam Yero, knight takes e4. If you've noticed, we've sort of subtly put all this pressure on his knight on d4, 
Now we take on e4, we win a pawn, and we expose the attack on d4. We now have three attackers. He's got two defenders. We just need to decide what to take on d4 with. Who can advise me in this area? What should we capture on d4 with, the knight or the bishop? I'll explain everything after the game, guys. Not the knight. You're falling for it. If you take with the knight, you pin yourself. That would be very dangerous because white would be able to castle and attack our knight. Pins, very dangerous. Be careful about them. And we should actually take with the queen. This is all theory. If we take with the knight, that knight is defended only by the queen and he'll be able to dislodge the queen by going knight to d5. Once again, I'll spell this out after the game. So we do accept an end game here. Okay, sometimes you just have to trade queens. That's part of the process. He refuses to trade queens. Uh, now let's not forget to complete our development. We're going to go to d6 in order to open up the bishop. Okay. Uh, and again, those of you who are like, what are you doing? I'll explain everything after the game. Let's develop our bishop. He castles long. Okay. So now, Joe Nathan, thank you for the sub. We have a situation with opposite side castling. What does that mean? What does it tell us about what we need to do? When we have opposite side castling, we immediately need to deploy our pieces toward his king. We have no time to waste. And as Innovative Panda says, let's begin by putting our rook on sort of a direct artery toward his king. What should we do now? Let's just start pushing him. Let's start bringing our pieces into the game with as much pizzazz as possible. Now, one thing that we can do, let's not forget, we have a nice outpost for our knight, right? Knight e5 is a nice move because we open up the rook's potential sacrifice on c3, which would shatter the which would shatter the pawns around his king. This is a no-brainer in the Sicilian. This is an absolute no-brainer because look at how weak his king is and look at this bishop on e6. It's directed at the pawn on a2. So let's not just grab this pawn mindlessly. Where can we put our queen and go for a greater prize than just taking the pawn? Ah, let's take the pawn. <laughs> I faked you guys out. We could have gone queen a4, but I'll explain after the game why uh, this is a better idea. Now we can go queen a3 and attack the pawn. Uh, there was a reason that I that I reconsidered going queen a4. Um... And I also like trolling people and faking them out and just being mean in general. It's something I like to do. Okay, um, what should we take on c4 with the bishop or the knight? A tricky question. Well, I know a lot of people are saying take with the knight because that seems to carry more possessed. But remember something. The, the queen and the, and the queen and the knight are the strongest attacking tandem in chess. Okay, so oftentimes you want to gear your moves toward leaving yourself with a queen and a knight. Because when the queen and the knight have your opponent's king in close quarters, they're just normally going to be more skilled at delivering that crushing blow than the queen and the bishop. That's not always the case, but oftentimes it is. And I think that's going to be the case here. Okay, now if he goes queen c2, one very important thing. Do not forget about tactical basics in the midst of an attack. I see this all the time. People get fixated on delivering checkmate. You're in checkmate mode and you forget to check for stuff like, no pun intended, for stuff like forks. Okay, who said we can't deliver a fork, girl? Knight e3 is going to win back the exchange. We're going to get into the end game. I know that sounds lame, but the reality is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I did not major in math, sorry. And he's got four. So we are up three pawns. That's an elementary win if we can adhere to basic end game principles, both one of which is to activate the non king pieces, the other is to activate the king itself. We're bringing it toward the center. Let's defend the pawn. We're going to bring it to e5. His rook is going to have absolutely no chance. His kingdom here is falling. And as we know in these endgames, there's many ways to win them. Let's not take on e4. Let's not rush this move because he's going to go rook e2 and take on e7. So let's preliminarily defend that pawn and maybe prepare the move f5. Why are we playing f5? What are we going for here? What's the most important thing to do in an endgame when you're up a million pawns? Can somebody spell it out to me concisely? We created a passer. In fact, we created two passers. In fact, we created three passers. And trust me, now we can just close our eyes. We can go on autopilot and we can just push them. In fact, we can give one of them away in order to promote another. Don't try to be greedy with your pass pawns. Try to understand which, which one of them you're going to promote in the end. Probably it's going to be the F pawn, which means that we can lure the rook into capturing D4. I didn't blunder this pawn. I lured it there so that now this pawn can be the one to promote. It still has its neighbor, which means that if he goes rook d1, which he probably will, he does. We can go e3, e2, and the pawns overwhelm the rook, and we promote the pawn at the end. Okay, I rushed that a little bit because I was getting low on time. 
But let me explain everything after the game. We're actually going to make two queens. Let's make two of them. Who says we can't make two queens? And let's get one of them here. With your permission, guys, I'm not going to explain these moves. I think that they're relatively understandable. Okay, he didn't even take our rook. This is going to be checkmate. All three pieces involved, full team effort, and that's the game. And what a complicated game it was. So let's go through it with a fine tooth comb. Now, the difference between the accelerated dragon and the main dragon, the main dragon is this, right? You go d6, and you go g6 on move 5. And the accelerated you omit the move d6, instead choosing to go g6 immediately on move 4. What is the main advantage of the accelerated over the main dragon? They both have their advantages over each other. In the accelerated, you apply immediate pressure on this knight on d4, right? You don't waste any time going d6. But on the other hand, this move d6 could be very valuable because it opens up the bishop. El Canto, thank you for the prime. Uh, now, let's go straight to the meat of it. What is this? Queen to b6. Now, let's do a little bit of chess history first. Who was the first person to actually develop this trap? I'm actually checking that. The first person to have ever played this move did it in the year, did it in the year 1958. Oh, how juicy is this? One of the people involved in falling for this trap is right here in this room. And for once, this person was on the white side of this trap. Thank you, Waterboy928. This person is this dashing gentleman here, who is the second from the left. Now, it's pretty small, but you guys can probably make out who it is. Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher, whose signature is right here. R. Fisher. And this is from... The Olympiad, I think, of 19, well, it's IX. I'm not sure which Olympiad this photo was taken in, but it may have very well been exactly the one in which Bobby Fischer fell for this trap in 1958. Bobby Fischer, who was by that time, I believe he was like 16 years old or so. Maybe somebody can correct me on this. Now, Bobby Fischer played a tournament in Poland in 1958. Already he was on his way to become a GM and he played Oscar Pano, who is an Argentinian grandmaster, very strong player. I think he's still alive. Pano also contributed to opening theory and Oscar Pano was the first person to have done this, this trap against none other than Bobby Fischer. How cool is that? And Fischer actually responded correctly and found the only path to equality. Now, why is queen b6 good? Because we put pressure on the knight and we also attack the b2 pawn, okay? Remember that pins go both ways. It's like a two-way street. I know that when you look at this position, optically, you see the fact that the queen is in the bishop's crosshairs. But remember that white has gone f3, which leaves the bishop undefended. And this fact is crucial because if the knight takes c6, what do we do? What do we do here? Craig Costa, thank you for the friend. And knight f5, I'll get to in a second. We play queen takes e3, and then we take the knight on c6. Now, knight f5 is the move that scares a lot of people because that knight simultaneously defends the bishop. But enter the second point of queen b6. We take b2. Guess what? Here's one knight that's under attack. Here's two knights that are under attack. Can white defend both of them at the same time? He absolutely cannot. Okay? If he takes on g7, we take c3, we take c4, and to add insult to injury, we're going to actually win this other knight. Um, so, so that's how this kind of thing works. Okay, uh, so knight f5 is not possible. Now, what, what should white actually do here? The only way that white can equalize here is actually to, to go bishop b3, drop the bishop back to lock in the queen's attack of b2, and now go knight to d5. This is the only way for white to equalize. Things get complicated here. I won't analyze this further. You can look at the Fisher game. Our opponent played queen d2, and now knight takes e4. We win a pawn, and our bishop now attacks the knight on d4. So we're going to win it back by taking the knight on d4. Okay. Um, so takes, bishop takes d4, and uh, we are simply up a pawn. Why didn't we take with the knight? Because he castles, and our knight is in a whole lot of trouble, right? We have to go e5, and that then creates a very big weakness on the d5 square. Now, um, badminton is cool. You're referencing a Fischer-Ryshevsky game, which was a slightly different opening. 
um, and I could show that one as well. But that was in a different opening. Good thinking, though. It was very similar. Vajan24, thank you for the prime. Now we move on to the attacking phase. He doesn't trade queens, so we simply complete our development. We have a hype train on top of everything else. Okay, um, so we centralize our knight. We also threaten bishop to g4, which would win the exchange. And fade back, thank you for the prime. Now here, I originally wanted to go queen a4 and attack a2, but I was a little bit concerned that our opponent would evacuate his king from the attacking zone. And this is actually, I'll make a little lesson out of this. Be very careful when you're attacking your opponent's king that you're not allowing that king to actually evacuate on its own two feet. Okay, that's a very typical narrative of attacks that don't work. And I've seen this time and time again. Even grandmasters can forget that the king itself can take matters into its own hands and escape an attack. Uh, and, 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 and in the heat of the moment, because you have so many pieces in the attack, you simply forget about it. Uh, you just don't think about it. And, uh, and, and that can happen in the, in the snap of a finger. I've actually had, well, I had a game where I managed to pull that on, one of my, oppo on my opponent once. And I can show you guys really, really quickly. Now, this is an example of the king simply evacuating the attack. Now, you guys can see I'm playing black here. This is from 2007. Thank you, Wix Voss, for the tier one. You can see that my king is under a, a, a great deal of stress, right? My king is being attacked. Let me just expand this. My king is being attacked. And guess what I did? I just said, let's get out of there. King f8, king e7, king d8. And uh, now my king is perfectly fine in the center. Okay? So literally, just on its own two feet, boom, boom, boom. Get out of there. Okay? So don't forget that the king can actually evacuate the attacking zone on its own two feet. Thank you, oopsies, poopsies, for the sub. Uh, and, and there's many better examples of this. Just That's just a quick one right there. So that's why I didn't go queen a4. That's why I played queen takes e3 to make sure that the queen covers this evacu evacuation route by the king. Now we go queen a3 because now the king cannot escape via c1. He has to give up more pawns. And now we simply transform the advantage from an attack to an extra exchange where it's going to be up three pawns in the end game. That endgame is going to be very easy. Does it make sense why I'm doing knight e3? There is no checkmate here. We could have also gone rook c8 and tried to go for the checkmate by bringing another attacker in, but I judged that there was no need to do that because we can simply transform the position into an easy win. Uh, one very important thing, what if he tries queen d3? That's a tricky move. Thank you, channel n05, Latinum blonde. Oh, we're going to get there. Now, the point of this move is that if we take his queen, he evacuates his rook. What should black do in this position? Very nice. Queen to b4, check. Escaping first, check. And then we take the rook. If he goes rook to d3, what about this one? A tricky question for you guys. What should black do here? Thank you, Latin and blonde. Knight takes c2 is correct because that knight simultaneously defends a3. So the tactics work out for me. He's got to acquiesce. And now we're simply up three pawns. We activate our rook. We activate our king. We create a pass pawn all by the book. We push our passers. We give up one of them to promote the other. And we make two queens and deliver the checkmate. Any questions about this game? So the accelerated dragon is super tricky opening. And I highly recommend it to a wide variety of players.